Our scripture reading today is Psalm 67. To the choir master with stringed instruments, a psalm, a song. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, Selah. That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. This is God's holy word. May he add his blessing to it. Amen. You can be seated. And let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would speak to us by your word here and now. Lord, may this moment not be wasted. May not any word fall to the ground and be flat and unused by you. But may you guide me, guide us, Lord. May your word be applied to our hearts by, your, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We desperately need you to give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that understand and treasure your word. So speak to us now, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. About a year ago... I made the decision to paddle across Okanagan Lake for the very first time. Uh, My sailing vessel was my trusty red uh, pelican kayak. And it was, I didn't know how to, what to expect. How long was this going to take? How tired would I get? Um, You know, but it was a perfect morning for it. It was a perfectly still October morning. And there were no boats, just me and a float plane that I was a little bit worried about, that he wouldn't land on me or something. But I realized fairly early on in my journey across the lake what my main problem would be. You discover it right away if you're ever sailing or boating or kayaking. That problem would be drifting off of course. Drifting off of course. That would be my main problem. You can waste so much effort And travel much further a distance than you need to travel if you go this way and that way and you drift off course. If you don't keep a straight line. If you drift off of your goal, you have to come at it again and again, right? And you end up taking so much more time. So it was imperative for me to pick a landmark. To say, that white house is what I am aiming for, and then to turn my, the nose of my boat in that direction and not let it go. Keep it there. Because only then would I be able to, to go the fastest and straightest way. And I eventually did just that. I made it across. I made it back again. My point in telling you this is, is simply this. It is easy in many things to go off course if you don't keep your eyes on the goal. If you don't keep your eyes set on the mission, it is so easy to drift off of course. Not just at sea, in life. You know, leadership gurus, they'll call this mission drift, right? And that's actually a really great phrase, mission drift. That it could happen to a business, right? You think of a business that starts to get into all sorts of things that are not their expertise. They kind of lose sight of what they were there for in the first place. And they stretch themselves thin. They kind of lose their way. And eventually they suffer for it. We call that mission drift. It can happen with government agencies. It can happen with nonprofits, corporations, businesses, clubs, even families. We all can lose our way. Lose, what are we here for? What should this be all about? And we drift. Well, it's no surprise that we could also see that in the church. Mission drift in the church. You know, think of the Roman Catholic Church prior to the Reformation. Now that was a mission drift, if there ever was one, right? I mean, instead of engaging in the Great Commission, instead of the gospel, heralding the gospel of the kingdom throughout the world, what was the church doing at that time in the, in the late 15th century, early 16th century. What were they doing? They were lining their coffers with indulgences money. 
in order to build bigger cathedrals and fancier and funnier hats. Okay? That's what they were up to. Talk about mission drift. It's like, what? have you guys been reading the Bible lately? Do you know what the church is for? Well, and then, as you know the story, then along came a monk named Luther and a ha- with a hammer in hand, right? And you know the story. The Reformation was a mission drift correction on a massive scale. Massive scale. It was a back-to-the-Bible movement, if ever there was a back-to-the-Bible movement. But what about today? Do we see mission drift in the church today? Absolutely we do. We see it, there's obvious examples. You have churches that are basically social clubs. You have some churches that have totally forgotten to preach the Bible. They, they're all about entertainment. They're all about um, really felt needs of the people, um, really being looked upon as, uh, as good by the whole community. They have all these things that have really attached their focus, and they have lost the mission of the church. You know, the emphasis in so many churches is to grow the numbers and grow the budget, but for its own sake. They don't really connect it to the mission anymore. It's just, we want to be a a happening place where things are going on. Bigger and better production. uh, More hype. More engagement online. Now, there's a way that things like more numbers and more giving, that could actually reflect that you're doing well at the mission, right? If But if it becomes an end in itself where you're disconnected from the mission, then it's not that. You see, for many North American churches, the unstated desire is to keep things exciting but still comfortable. Okay? I want to be somewhere that's growing and seems to be, you know, healthy and alive. But I also want to be able to sit back and not be challenged too much. I don't really want to be on the front lines of things. I don't want, you know, to be getting pelted by eggs as I come into the church. I don't want protesters uh, at my church against me. I don't want there to be uh, a cost for being associated with that. A lot of people, this is kind of the Christianity they want. And yet there is one critical thing that can shake this whole comfortable, domesticated Christianity thing up. And that thing is this, when we rediscover the real mission of the church, when we stop drifting and we see the landmark again and say, that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what we're all about. And it doesn't matter what opposes us, we must fulfill this mission. Really, what can shake us up is when a Luther, as it were, takes the hammer, takes the truth, and nails it to the door and says to us, Friends, I don't think we should be going this way. Friends, I think, I think that this is the mission of the church. I think that this is what we're supposed to do. I think we're off course. Now, I'm convinced that many in the church today are asleep. Many who claim the name of Christ are asleep. They are half alive to the things of God. They are only dimly aware of the calling that God has on their life. They're only dimly aware of the commission that they have and of the call of discipleship. They don't know their marching orders. Or if they do, they're only giving it a half-hearted effort. There are, in, there are entire churches and denominations that are cruising on autopilot. If the Holy Spirit left the church, the programs would keep on running, as it were. They are utterly lukewarm and adrift. They are not on mission. They are not focused on what God has for them. Now, what can change them and what can change you and me when we've grown cold? Because it's not just people out there and churches out there that are the problem. We need to look within. This is a sermon for you and for me. What can we do? What can change us uh, when we've drifted? And the answer, again, is this. The goal, the mission, the purpose for why we're here. When that becomes center stage in our minds yet again. We need the mission to be burned into our minds and fired into our souls. We need to snap out of the slumber and remember who we are. And remember, more importantly, who God is and what God has told us to do and what God has told us, who he's told us to be and what he's planned to do through us in this world. And that mission is not a mystery at all. It is written boldly in the scriptures. So as we, as we get into the sermon today, into this psalm, I want to start here with just a, a, 
kind of a little introduction on what is the mission of the church. What is the mission? Well, first we want to ask, what is God's mission? Not just what's ours, but what is God up to in this world? And the answer is this. God is saving a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation through Christ for his glory forever and ever. That's all throughout the word of God. We learn that at the end of the story. And usually, you know, the end of a story is a great place to find the purpose of a story. What is history all about? We'll read in Revelation. We read Revelation 5, verses 9 to 10. Speaking of Christ, it says this, Revelation 5, 9 to 10. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood... You ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. And as we read on, it's, that's the end. They will do that forever and ever and ever. In the end, there will be this kingdom of priests. These people who know God, who've been brought back to God through the work of Christ on the cross. This is the meaning of history. When he opens the seals, this is what's being said is, what does it all mean? Who's going to tell us the end of the story? Who's going to tell us the revelation of everything? Jesus is the one who can tell us that because he is the center of human history. The cross is the crux, the cross of human history. It's the center And the work of Christ and him applying that work through the rest of history is the great mission, not only just of God, of what God is up to, but it becomes our mission as well, this advance of the kingdom. You know, Paul sums this up at the beginning of Ephesians as well. He he really says that salvation of sinners through Christ is and always has been God's plan A. So you don't get the wrong idea that, that, you know, God created this perfect world and then mankind sinned and God said, oh no, what will I do? What will I do? I better think up of a plan to, to fix this. This is not what I hoped. You know, there's a sense we have to think of God's will this way that God does not desire our sin. He doesn't will for us to sin. But when we read this, and I'll read this in Ephesians 1, we see that God's plan, his purpose, in a sense his will, has been not only to see a perfect creation that just never fell, but his story has always been that there would be a fall and that there would be a redemption through Christ. This was plan A. Let me read it to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. You see that? That's plan A. We, we even read in the scriptures that he, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, that the plan was for the cross right before God created the world. Now that's enough to, to tell you God's ways are higher than our ways. We, who, who's known the mind of the Lord? Who could become his counselor? Who could understand this? We just stand back and on and say, the mercy of God. We are being caught up in a grand story. We are characters in God's grand story. And that doesn't reduce your dignity because you're not this independent, autonomous agent. No, this is how God is God, and you are a creature. And God is weaving an amazing story in this world. So what is God up to in the world? He is saving a people from every nation through Jesus Christ. He's redeeming us from the fall. He's making all things new. He's bringing us back to himself. And he's doing it all for his glory. The last point I just said there is really crucial. This is all for his glory. This is all for his glory. Everything God does is for his own glory. Habakkuk 2.14 is the future of the world. 
Let me read it to you. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That is God's plan for the world, and it will happen through Christ's redeeming work. Well, what about us? How do we fit? How does the church fit? Well, we fit right in. Because God has determined to do his work through people. That's how God does his work. The work of Christ is applied by the Holy Spirit, but it's advanced by his people. This is the Great Commission, right? Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he doesn't just say, and so therefore I'm going to keep on working here on earth. I'm going to stay here forever and do all these things myself. No, what what does Jesus say? What does God say to us in that moment? He has all authority, and so I have a job for you. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all all that I have commanded you and behold I am with you to the very always to the end of the age that's the mission of the church we see it all throughout the book of Acts you know Acts 1 8 we read but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth and that's exactly what they do When you read the book of Acts, they go from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth, being his witnesses. The book of Acts ends with Paul in Rome. Rome at the time, that's the center of the world. That's the center of the ends of the earth, as it were. And we read these words. Therefore, let it be known to you that this, this is Paul speaking, that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen And then here's the summary statement. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Now, have you ever noticed that Acts doesn't end with the phrase after that, and that's the end of the story, the end. And Paul lived happily ever after. No, it's not a a happily ever after. It's not a the end. The assumption is that you and I are living in Acts 29 or 30, 31. We are carrying on the story. Really, it's the Acts of the Apostles. But as the work of the Apostles has been established and we have it in the Word of God, we carry on the Great Commission as the church. We carry this on, and, we, and really it's the acts of the Holy Spirit through his people, and those have not ceased for one minute. They have not ceased for these 2,000 years. They carry on. We go to all the world with kingdom hope unfurled. That's what we do. So the mission of the church marches on. Here's how Kevin DeYoung sums it up in his book, What is the Mission of the Church? Here's the quote. What's the mission of the church? The mission of the church is to go into the world and make disciples by declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit and gathering these disciples into churches that they might worship the Lord and obey his commands now and in eternity to the glory of God the Father. Point your kayak towards that. Let us point our ship towards that. That is our aim That's our focus. Now here's the amazing thing. So much of all of that can be seen in Psalm 67. Okay, you're thinking, is he going to get to Psalm 67? Yes. Let's look at Psalm 67. This psalm is a prayer, not just for Israel to pray, but for the church to pray, for the people of God for all time. Look again at verses 1 and 2. May God be gracious to us and bless us, And make his face to shine upon us. That your way may be known on earth. Your saving power among all nations. Here's the first point here. God blesses us for the salvation of nations. God blesses us, his people, who are already his people. He will bless us for the sake of salvation for the nations. Don't miss that connection. We see it in that little word in the start of verse 2. That that God be gracious to us bless us 
Make your face to shine upon us. Why? Why? Read it. That your way may be known on earth. That, that, that we would be able to spread your fame across all the nations. That people would be saved. That nations would be saved. That the peoples would praise you. This is why God blesses his chosen people. That the knowledge of God would spread across the whole world. It was true for Israel and it's true for the church. Remember the calling of Abram, or of Abraham, but known as Abram at the start? Genesis 12, 1 to 3, this is the same theme. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. Did you miss that? So that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Every tribe, every tongue. You know that what is a nation? What is a tribe? What is a people group? Is it not just a big family? Is it not just an overgrown family? It's exactly what they are. And we could categorize them different ways, and the scriptures themselves do that. But the, but the fact is, is that even here in Genesis 12, God had a plan not just for the Jews, not just for this people of Israel, but he had a plan for the whole world, for every family on the earth, every nation of the earth shall be blessed. And it shall be blessed through this one plan. Later in Genesis, when the Lord was about to destroy Sodom, We read that the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. This has always been the plan. God starts small, and then it gets big. It starts really small, but it'll be incredibly big. One man, with his faith in the Lord, is the beginning But in the end, his children will be as the sand of the seashore and as the stars in the heavens. And we're not talking about his physical descendants. No. We read this in Galatians, Galatians 3, 7 to 9. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. This is the pattern. God blesses his people so that the blessing would overflow. We are not meant to be a cul-de-sac, okay? A little one-way stop where we're going to hoard all of God's blessings into our little stagnant pond of blessings. No, we're meant to be a river, God is going to pour into us so that we can pour it out. We're like a conduit. We're not meant to be an end in ourselves. We're not to be a a hoarded pond of blessings. We're to be a conduit of his mercy, passing it along, as it were, paying it forward. That should be the character of every church, of every Christian, of the people of God, that we are busy doing God's work of being a blessing to to all the nations. That we are taking the blessing that we've received and we are paying it forward. That is what we're to do. And this leads us to our second point, that this prayer in our text is not just a prayer, it's a promise. The prayer is a promise. You know, do you want to know a secret? A secret about this? This psalm is a prayer that you could pray that will receive a guaranteed yes. This prayer is a guaranteed yes prayer, this psalm, for the people of God. You pray this prayer, God will say yes, yes. Why do I say that? Well, we pray that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. And we pray that not as a wish upon a star, oh Lord, I hope that you'll save the nations. But we pray it in confidence that this is exactly what God has promised and planned to do. We actually read really the promised version of this prayer in Isaiah 49, which says of Christ, I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. We pray, 
Lord, may your saving power reach to the end of the earth. And God has already said, I will. I will do that. That's exactly what I'm doing in the world. My salvation will reach the end of the earth. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's inevitable. It's happening. And now the, the, the smart aleck among us might say, well, then why do I have to pray? And here's what the Bible says to you. Stop it. Stop saying silly things like that. Don't say that. The fact is God is sovereign. God is sovereign, and yet we're responsible. He is not just the God who makes a plan and then executes the plan by zapping it into being. God is way more sophisticated than that, to use a a term that really shouldn't apply to God. God is way above that. God can ordain the end and all of the means that will accomplish that end. And some of those means are you. You are the means, the means, you know, the the pathway of how this is going to happen. What is the instrument that God's going to use? He's going to use you praying that God would do this in order for him to do this. He didn't just plan to do it. He planned for you to pray for him to do it. And that's why we even have Psalm 67. Because God wants you to pray. God wants your heart to become like his heart. That you love what he loves. That you want what he wants. That the things that are on God's heart are the biggest thing on your heart. That you have come out of your shell. You've come out of your smallness and your self-focus. We all, we all drift into this, don't we? Where we're so small, we're so provincial in our thinking. And yet God says, look up. You know what you need to be praying more than any other prayer request right now? Lord, send workers into your harvest field. Lord, finish the Great Commission. Use me. Use my friends. Use my church. Use anything that you want to use. We are on mission. I am looking at one thing on the shore, and it's what you told me to look at. You said, this is what God has done. This is what God is doing in this world. And he uses us both to pray for it and to accomplish it. You see, when you pray the prayer, oh Lord, send out workers into the harvest field, you better watch out. Because God might answer that prayer by tapping you on the shoulder and saying, I've got just the guy. I've got just the gal. You need to go there. You need to talk to your neighbor. You need to go out downtown. You need to go and and speak with your family members that you haven't. You need to write some letters. You need to get engaged in the mission that God has for you. Well, here's the third point. We are focused, and this psalm teaches us this, that we are focused on seeing the gospel spread everywhere. Notice that this psalm is not just, everyone, make sure you take care of your neighbors. It's not what this psalm's about. This psalm is going to the uttermost ends of the earth, And I would submit to you that every Christian needs to have this on their minds. You might have a very local mission that God gives you. You might have many things that are really just right here that you need to do. And I'm not trying to take you away from that in the slightest. But in that and beyond that, you need to never lose sight of the big picture. This is like if you were fighting in in a war if you were in World War II, and and here you are trying to win this little battle. Maybe you're winning this little battle in the western part of France, okay? But, But don't, you wouldn't want that soldier to be only consumed with that, where he didn't even know that actually we're fighting Germans, and we're actually trying to get to Berlin, and we're actually trying to end a big war, you know, and and being so so tunnel visioned we don't want to be that way as christians well look again at the text what is what is the prayer that god's way may be known on earth that you're saving power among all nations notice these phrases let the peoples praise you let all the peoples praise you let the nations be glad let the peoples praise you let all the peoples praise you Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Now I have to ask the very real question here for each of us. Is this your prayer? Do you pray like this? Is this at the top of your prayer list? Lord, save the nations. 
Lord, let the peoples praise you, all of them. Lord, make China sing for joy. Let Haiti be glad. Let Guinea praise you. Turn the hearts of the Muslim world to Christ. Let them praise you, Lord. O God, let all the peoples praise you. You see, this text is the reason why we pray the way we do here at Redeemer. This is why we have a prayer meeting that is bookended with missions, that we pray for missionaries, we pray for countries, we pray for the advance of the gospel. Some of you might have thought, well, I want to pray for my Aunt Gladys's stubbed toe. And I'm saying, I'm sorry, we, we can pray for that too. God cares about stubbed toes, but we are not going to lose sight of the mission. We're going to set the tone of this prayer meeting to be a prayer meeting for the advancement of the gospel, for the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And so if we err on that side, that is okay. We are trying to stay focused. And yet, even as I say this, I don't want you to hear the wrong thing here. Um, that really everyone has to become a foreign missionary. Or that everything you do has to be evangelism. You see, much of life is going to fall under the category of discipleship of really living out this great commission in your own life, in the life of your family and your kids, in the life of the world, where you're in your parenting, education, workplace. And so all of life can be caught up into this broader mission, okay? And this comes in through discipleship. Uh, really, discipleship meaning to being a follower of Christ. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? Christ is concerned about that, not that you would just immediately and only be thinking about the nations, but that you would let his work take root in your heart and make you a disciple of Christ and let that permeate your habits, let that permeate your work, let that permeate your family culture. And, and yet with all of this, it's imperative that we are actually doing all things for the glory of God. You know, that, that, that these things, we don't just use it as an excuse, that we, we live for the glory of God and for the mission by connecting all that we do to the overarching mission, okay? We set our eyes on the goal. Why are we still here on earth? We're always asking that question. What is the great task that we've been given as Christians? And we know to make disciples of all the nations. Great. So have supper with that in mind. Go to work with that in view. Teach your kids with that in mind. Think about their education with that in mind. Spend your free time with that in mind. Don't lose sight of the mission. Let the mission of God and, and of this great commission really characterize and flavor everything you do. And this is part of what it means, as we read in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And, and you've seen, what is God's mission? How does God planning and purposing to be glorified in this world? Through making disciples of all nations, bringing them all into his family, that they would praise him forever. And so you look at your life and you look at what God has you doing and you say, Lord, connect that to your mission. Make my work count. Make my giving count. Make my free time count. Lord, save my family. Save my neighbors. Lord, help us to be part of your mission. As Paul told Timothy, you're in the army now. Don't get lost in civilian pursuits. So why do we focus on missions? Why do we pray for Haiti and for Guinea and for China? Why, why should we spend so much money to send people across the world? Why risk our lives and spend our efforts on this type of work? Because this is the heart of God. This is the heart of God. And so we need to be in step with the heart of God. The fourth point here from the psalm is this. The end goal isn't actually missions. Somewhat surprisingly in light of what I've already said, right? The end goal isn't actually missions. It's worship. It's worship. While we're here on earth, the Great Commission is our great task. We are going to be busy with this task. This is what we're looking at and trying to achieve. In a very real sense, it's our focus. But there's something really important that we need to get right. And that's this, that all of this is actually about worship. It's all about worship. Saying for the glory of God is not just a nice tagline. A nice little line to tag on the end of the real work of the church that, oh, we, we're making disciples and blah, blah, blah. 
and don't forget to say, and all for the glory of God. No, no, no. The glory of God is the point. It's the point. It's actually why we do missions. It's actually why our hearts are burning within us to complete this task because we worship God now. We've seen his, his glory. We've seen his beauty. And so what more do we want to do than to bring others into that glory? We've received the blessing. We want to pour it out. Why? Because we're worshiping God. We're worshiping God. We aren't aiming to have people join us in reluctant obedience to God or mere assent to his truth. No, what do we read in the text? Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. We need to sing for joy. And then we need to bring these nations and others into that joy. That is what the Great Commission is all about. Bringing people into soul-fulfilling worship of the God who made them. John Piper wrote a pretty famous book on missions based around this psalm. And the title of it is, Let the Nations Be Glad. Let me just read you the very first paragraph of the book. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. That phrase, missions exist because worship doesn't, is powerful. And it really clarifies what we're doing. I am not making an appeal to you just based on Think of the poor people out there. Would you help the poor people? As much as that is something that actually should, should really tug on your heart, you should care about lostness. You should think about these people in Afghanistan and North Korea and China and places of India who are literally living and dying without ever even hearing the name of Christ. How are they to believe if no one sends a preacher? How are they ever to come to Christ? There's no hope for them unless missions, okay? Unless missions. But this goal is not mainly man-centered. It's God-centered. We're saying we, we love God so much. We have seen his glory, and it is so great. It is, it is a travesty that there are places in this world that spurn him, that reject him still. We want to fix that. We are burdened that the lamb would receive the reward for his sufferings around the world. That is what motivates missions. So worship is not only the goal of missions that we would make more worshipers of Christ, but it's also the fuel for missions. It's the fuel for missions. The desire to share him with others and to bring others into our joy is the completion of our praise you see, if we haven't been moved by God's glory ourselves, we will never be moved to missions, or at least not for very long. Or if we are, the missions that we do are not going to be very good. The missions that God is talking about here in Psalm 67 is the spreading of joy, of irresistible joy. We are going on a mission to make Kelowna glad, joyful, Never be ashamed of sharing the gospel. You are giving people the greatest gift. Don't think, oh, I'm sorry to impose upon you, sir. I don't mean to take your time. No, take their time. Take their time. They might not know it, but you have good news for them. You have the answer, okay? If you had the cure for cancer, would you hide it? If you had, if you had billions of dollars to shower on everyone else, would you hoard it? Or would you give? You see, this is what we ought to do. When we've received the blessing of God, this is why this psalm is bookended with this. May God bless us so that he would be known. And look at how it ends. It says, God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. He's going to do it. He's going to bless his people and the ends of the earth will come to know him. The question simply is this. How are you doing in this story? What is your part to play? Where's your heart? 
in this moment? Where is your heart? Do you love the Lord and his mission? Do you exist? If someone said, hey, what's your purpose of life? Would you say, I exist to spread a passion for God. I exist to spread the fame of God's name among all the nations, starting right here in Kelowna. That's why I'm here. I'm here to spread the fame of God's name. If I die, I want that to be on my tombstone. He lived for the glory of God. What, what was he all about? He was all about Jesus. That was a Jesus freak. He was a Jesus guy. He was a gospel guy. That lady kept telling me about her Savior. She kept praising him. She was so joyful. She was so moved by the gospel. She would never stop telling me about it. She told her friends. She told her neighbors. She gave money to missionaries. She gave, she gave to the work of the gospel. It dominated her life. It dominated his life. Is that your story? It must be your story if you are to be faithful because this is God's mission. This is the mission of the church. Point your life in that direction and never lose sight until he takes you home. And then the ultimate goal will become the main goal again, which is to worship him, to worship him. There'll be no people in your peripheral that you need to bring into the worship. They'll already be worshiping with you before the throne. Now, a lot of what I've said this morning, as we bring this to a close, has been to challenge us in praying this prayer and living lives that are in line with God's heart and in line with this prayer. But I don't want to miss this really important fact. We are the answer to this prayer. We already, you, if you're a believer today, you are one of the answers to this prayer. And who knows which Christians prayed this prayer for you. But I'll tell you one thing, it was prayed here in the Psalms and it's been prayed by the people of God for millennia. And here you are in the ends of the earth. Is, what is Kelowna but the ends of the earth? This is not the ends of the earth. If you think of where Jerusalem was, where it all started, where we are now, I think you, you can hardly get further, can you? And here you are. And what are you doing today? You're worshiping. Are you filled with joy? Is this, is this, are these people praising him? Oh, let the peoples praise him. He's letting it happen. He's making it happen in your life. You, Christian, filled with joy, filled with gladness in God, you are the answer to this prayer. And here you are, praising God, worshiping Jesus, the Messiah. The kingdom is advancing today. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord is beginning to cover the earth even today. Can you see it? Can you see it? We pray, thy kingdom come, knowing that in a very real sense, it has already come. It is here, and yet it is advancing. And we long for the day when it will be fulfilled in fullness. There's an already and a not yet. But don't miss the already. That the kingdom has come that you are part of the church, which is part of this kingdom work that is advancing in the world. And so we confidently pray for the kingdom to continue to advance in this world. We pray the prayer of this psalm, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let's pray. Lord, this is our prayer, that we would be caught up into your great mission Lord, that each one of us would be saved, that we would know the glory of the gospel, that we'd be filled with joy, unspeakable and full of glory, that we would abound in hope, and Lord, that that hope would overflow, that you would bless us, O oh God. Would you bless this church so that we would be a blessing, so that the ends of the earth would receive salvation, so that the peoples would praise you, O oh God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Let us be glad and sing for joy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.